So last week we were talking about unity, getting in unity by the Spirit. And um, I know that's a cry of so many of our hearts. I know, because we've gone through so much attack on this mountain. The enemy has hit so hard because he does not want us to come together. Because there's power when we come together. There's power when we walk in love. There's power when we focus on his name. Amen. If one can set a thousand to flight, two can set tens of thousands to flight. How many can 12, 15, 20, 30 Ooh, set to flight? Yeah, he's in trouble. He's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and prophetically, I have to say this last week, I have felt a shift in yeah. the spirit on the mountain. Yeah. James confirmed it. And then I heard today on uh, Give Him 15 Dutch Sheets, he said the same thing. Yeah. He said there's been a spiritual shift. He sensed it the last two weeks. I'm like, praise God, confirmation, you know? Where two or three confirmed, so I got it, you got it, Dutch Sheets confirmed it, and I'm sure others of us have felt it too. Um, the battle has been so fierce, and the Lord has been showing me some stuff about warfare and deliverance, and it's like, we all want to take the mountain for the Lord. I think all of us do. I mean, you guys don't live on the mountain, but you want to take the LA and the California and the, the world for the Lord. So, but this is a high place and, and in war, um, high places were always significant. And last week we talked about when Jesus went up to the mountain, he got transfigured. When Moses went up to the mountain, he got transfigured. There's something about being up on the mountain. Amen. And when I first moved up here, when I, before I moved up, when I was trying to move up, and there was such warfare for me to put a stake in the ground here with my name on it, well, because the devil else. did not want this kind of stuff happening. That's right. There is sincere warfare, right? But the Amen. Lord said to me, I was just focused on finally, I can find an affordable house and still drive to work in LA, wow. And so I'm, and I pulled up the mountain. And I'm like, oh, I love this place. It reminds me of like a cowboy town. I'm like, where am I? This is something my dad would have loved, you know? <laughs> and I just loved it. The minute I pulled up and the Lord spoke to me, he said, this is my mountain. And I'm like, yeah, Lord, they are all yours. They're all yours. And he said, I'm taking it back. What does that say to you? And someone else took it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Something else. That something else besides the Lord, has had domain on this mountain. Now, how do those things happen? Now, this is all improvised. This isn't even what I was going to share, with, but, but I think this is what God was showing me in the, in the worship. So, the enemy has had strongholds on this mountain for a long time. And I believe that happens when there's witchcraft, <coughs> occult practices, Innocent blood is shed. They come up to the high places too. They know about it. The, the occult. The, the, the devil's children target this kind of place. My pastor, you know, Pastor Pam and Rick, they came up for the first housewarming and they were like, oh my gosh, there's so much witchcraft up there. I couldn't even, ah. I mean, people that are sensitive in the spirit when they come up here, they're like, uh, there's so much witchcraft. And I'm like, well, that's why we need to keep coming. And we need to, we need to come with a counter spirit. We need to come with the Holy Spirit. We need to come and worship him and glorify him because it's when we bring his presence, when we focus on him, his glory comes down. We get transfigured more in his image. We get his light, his love, his glory. Then we can go out and our families, our marriages, our children, our yes. neighbors, our Thank community God. changes. Amen. But Amen. see, I think, and I'm a warrior. Like everybody that knows me, that's known me for any amount of time knows that about me. It's no like, way. <laughs> believe it or not, way. way. Yes, but way. Um, they call me Davidina. Yahweh. No, but, um, <laughs> but the thing is, God's been it. teaching me through some hard yeah. battles. He's, he's taught me like for the last 30 years, I've gone through a lot of warfare. But now he's showing me things like, I got blessed with, we had guest speakers come to our church who are very seasoned veterans in the Lord. I don't know if you guys know, um, now I can't think of his name, Paul Keith Davis and his wife, but they're like veterans, they're, they're generals in the faith. He's a prophet. And he came in and he said, for our leader meeting, he goes, 
The best way to take the land back is you poke holes. You, you go through the darkness with the light. You, you pursue the presence of God. You have glory centers, glory homes, glory, which is what we're doing. What you guys were doing, which hopefully you'll be back soon on Friday. We'll pray about it. We're going to pray for that when you're ready because it is, it is a lot of warfare. And you're going to start one. I know that's on your heart for a long time. And whoever else is going to be starting them. I think God wants us to have at some point every night of the week, every night of the week in Fraser Park, worship and, and, and teaching and equipping the saints. But before, I think the order that he wants to do is he wants us to all come together first. Then they're going to be like popcorn, like sprouting, sprouting, sprouting. Mm. And that he wants us all to go wherever we can. I mean, ideally to everyone every night, every week, if we can. I mean, if we're exhausted, tired, working, sick, whatever, you know, there's grace. But I think that's the vision that he's showing me that he wants up here. So, but, but we had to get back into unity first. And the way he showed me to do that is to focus on him. Amen. Give him the glory. Amen. Focus on him. Amen. Not on us, not on our righteousness, not on our failures, not on our sin, not on our mistakes, not on our shortcomings. Focus on him and what he's done for us, his goodness. Give him the glory. And when we do that, he's going to meet us here. He's meeting us here tonight. Amen. He's doing it. And this is where we get healed. This is where we get delivered. This is where we get empowered. And then when we're empowered by his spirit and we're in unity, we go out, we heal the sick, raise the dead, take up serpents and cast out devils. We go out as teams, which is what I know Nancy and Sean and Jerry and you guys have had a huge heart for this mountain for so long you guys have been trudging and trudging and trudging to do evangelism, and Carolyn, to evangelize out here and like the, the open park and the, all of that, like the outreaches. But see, he wants to equip us and fill us first because the old church model, he's, we're entering into the kingdom age. The, the church age, which we are transitioning through now, this is the year of the door. We're going through the door. The door is Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's right. Back to kingdom. Back to what did Jesus do? What did he say? He told us, if you're my disciples, if you have faith, if you believe, these signs will follow. How many of us have been taught that scripture but never experienced it? How many of us have not seen the power of the signs and the wonders and the miracles? So many of us have not experienced it. We're hit and miss. We're hit and miss, you know, because we can have faith, but we can also have unbelief. But I really feel this is part of what the unity is about, is getting our minds renewed, getting us back to what did Jesus say, what did he do? What did he do? He went up to the mountain. <laughs> he got transfigured in the glory. Amen. And he was the son of God. Yes. But and then he told us when he died, he was going to go to the right hand of the Father, and he said, it's better that I die. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is who our helper is. Amen. See, so, so many churches have taught about Holy Spirit, but they don't realize he's a person. He's, a, he's the third person of, the, of God. He's, there's the Father in heaven, Jesus is at the right hand, and the Holy Spirit is here. Holy Spirit is here. But he's a gentleman, and he's likened to a dove, and he gets grieved easily. So... We don't want to grieve him, and we want to make sure that when we're operating in the gifts of the Spirit, which we're learning, and we're being equipped, and we're being trained, and we're getting impartation, and hopefully this and other house churches, that's the safe place to practice your gifts yeah. through reason of use. This is how we grow in the gifts. You can have a safe place. We don't want to like step out in the wrong spirit. Maybe you have a spirit of divination. And we're calling it prophecy. And people with discernment need to be able to go, mm, that's, sister, I love you, or brother, I love you, but that, I don't think that was Holy Spirit. I still love you, but let's see what's going on. Where did that spirit come from? Maybe, the, maybe there's an open door in your life through, maybe through astrology, witchcraft, sorcery, uh, whatever. There's something in your family line. There's masonry in your family. Whatever it is, where it came in, there's no condemnation 
But Jesus is coming for a spotless bride and he wants to clean us so that we can be pure and spotless, right? I think a lot of us are also being taught about deliverance now. There's been a teaching in most churches for so long that, well, if you're you're saved, if you got Jesus, you can't have a demon. Just done. And I'm like, "Mm." I don't know when I, I was saved as a kid, but when I rededicated my life to the Lord at 28 years old, I said, Lord, please cleanse me of everything that isn't of you, from you, or for you. And then I did we a need fast. To do it every day. Yeah, we should. Well, we should. Hopefully, we get to the point where we stop opening the door to the devil, mm-hmm. and then you don't have to keep cleansing regularly. You know what I'm saying? But it's like a quick repentance. But but at that time, I needed some serious cleansing because I was coming out of the world, New Age, Hollywood, all that. So I said that. Then I was fasting. And the next thing you know, I'm vomiting up my guts. I threw up about 40 times. I couldn't stop. And it was a violent, visceral deliverance for me. Yeah, you've been delivered. Hallelujah. Praise God. And when I was like, Lord, what was that? Like, the doctor's like, I don't understand why it's so, like, you can't stop throwing up. You must have been really poisoned. And when the doctor said that, the Lord said, remember you prayed to cleanse you of everything that wasn't of you, from you, or for you? And he goes, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. And I went, oh. And I'm like, but I was so like violent. And he goes like, he reminded me of the scripture, the dog doesn't return to its vomit. He said, you're a very visceral person, because I've always been an athlete and all that. He said, and a dancer and all that. And he goes, you, I wanted you to have a visceral deliverance that you'd never forget. And 30 years later, I never forgot it. It's like it happened yesterday. And there's been more deliverance since then, right? Because if you open up the doors again, then you need to get delivered again. But the goal, I think, is, is for us to get to that point where we're walking with him in victory Amen. and where we're together in unity and where we're getting in his presence so we're getting strengthened by him and we're getting in the word and we're encouraging each other, linking arms in the battle. We're praying for one another. And we're loving one another so that we're so tight together as an army that we don't fall. That we don't slip. And that if one slips and falls, you pick them up. Amen. If your brother falls, you pick them up. That's why two are better than one. So one sets a thousand to fly, two sets tens of thousands to fly. How many can we all set the flight up here? So I feel like this is a strategy. We're the mountain of evil. Right. We're cleansing it of evil. And I feel like when we got that billion dollar winner on our little mountain and that little mini mart in the middle of town, a billion dollar lot. And I'm not saying God is advocating gambling. It, it was a sign to me that God is going to do a suddenly of his prosperity. Prosperity, not just financially, of the soul. Did because he wants... Was, honey? No. Did say? I don't know. But he's he, got to pray that he uses that money. For here. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. He's a Christian. Well, that would be great. or we'll become one. So anyway, so um, that to me, because I know since, only since I've been here, I know you guys have been praying forever. Nancy, Jerry, others of you have been on the Howard. Howard. You guys have been here a long time praying. Sheila, you've been praying. She, Carolyn, praying and praying and praying. But since I've been here uh, two and a half years, every day I'm out walking. I'm sure you guys all see me out here at different places. He's had me walk on almost every single street in town, north, south, east, and west end. And every day that I'm walking, I'm praying. And I'm praying for God to forgive and heal the people, that they would be delivered of witchcraft and occult practices, unforgiveness, bitterness, uh, addictions. I'm, and I'm praying that, that he would bring his healing so that the land could be prospered. Be, as the people prosper, the land will be prospered. And so that sign to me of that billion dollar winner was like accumulation of all of our prayers and all of our worship gatherings and all of our all of your evangelism and all of your prayers and all of our outreach and all of these house groups and all the churches that God we had a turnaround. We just had a shift in the spirit. That was a sign and a wonder. I got so excited that day. I had chills up and down my arms. I was like, God, it's happening. Finally, the light of God, the light that we bear in Christ, the the love and the truth is outweighing the darkness on this mountain. It's piercing through. So what he's taught me is, and we had a little lesson with this last week. Some of you were here, some of you weren't, but um, there's no names mentioned, but, but we had something. We were all in unity, peaceful worship. Some, a couple of people came in, warriors came in and kind of took over and went like to town with violent tongues and like rebuking a bunch of demons in the region and in the, all over. 
It actually, I had a real big backlash for two days. I couldn't sleep. It was, it was very, um, it was very stressful because disturbing. it was very disturbing. And I had to pray and I'm like, Lord, okay, what was this and how do I handle it? It's my home. It's the ministry he's entrusting me to. We're all on different levels. We're all on different, not, not saying better or higher or lower. We've all, we were all coming from different angles of the word. Some of us are familiar with deliverance. Some of us are not. Mm -hmm. Some of us understand the spiritual warfare. Some of us don't know that much about it. And so the way it happened, in my opinion, was out of order. It was out of order. You don't just come into a region or a territory or someone else's house or church and take over. You don't do it. The reason why is that the backlash against the, the, not only the homeowner, but, but all of us in the meeting, it can be a big backlash in the spirit because we have to use wisdom in how we fight. We don't, because here's the other thing. When you pray for deliverance, we should focus on individuals that are ready. That's why we have the mercy seat. That's why when people come and they start crying and they start weeping, we pray for them. They get delivered. They get, because sometimes it's like, sometimes it's easy. You just cast out a demon. We have authority in the name of Jesus. We just cast out demons. But what if they're not ready to let go? Mm-hmm. What if there's some inner healing that they need first before they're able to let go of their gluttony, their addiction, their whatever, their greed, their, their need for, their, their, that need for validation. There, there has to sometimes be a process of inner healing with the deliverance. The so the pain has to go. And there has to be a sense of safety and support. And when, when they're ready to let go, then we cast these things out. Because if they're not ready, what did Jesus say? He said, go and sin no more or a worse thing will come upon you. So if you come into a room or a region or, and you just randomly take out your Uzi and go to all the demons in the room, you may be stirring it up a little worse. It could become worse for some of the people in the room. So this was the responsibility I felt as a leader and as in being in my home. I, I, had, I was up for two nights. I literally couldn't sleep. The, the adrenaline and the, the cortisol in my brain was shot to another level. So I've spoken with this person. We worked it out. They're super sweet and loving and kind, forgiving. We worked it out. We're, we're good. But um, I just wanted, as a, as a person who, I let it happen. But it was because I was so caught off guard. I didn't really know what to do in the moment. And, and I felt like if I stood up and matched their energy and their anger, it was going to get ugly. And I thought, I just had to kind of sit there. Then the next day, Howard sends a message from the Upper Room Church in Dallas. And I'm driving to our church in Burbank. And it's about, this, this lady said, because I'm like, Lord, what did, I, did I do the wrong thing? Did I tolerate Jezebel? Did I let Jezebel? The spirit of Jezebel, not the person, a spirit. We're dealing with spirits, territorial spirits on this mountain. Jezebel, the reason why I thought it was Jezebel was I got sick. And in, in Revelation, it talks about the spirit of Jezebel. If you tolerate that spirit, it gives you sickness. And I was like, did I tolerate Jezebel? Should I have stood up and, and said, no, please, not right now. Don't do it that way. But um, there's, there's grace. And what, what this message said was meekness, the meek shall inherit the earth. And what meekness is, mm-hmm. is power under control. It's I'm not being weak. Either. No, God is not a God of confusion. So power under control. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you're powerless. It doesn't mean you're useless and you just sit there like a little worm on the ground. You have power because we have power by the Holy Spirit. We have power in his name. We have authority in his name. But we got to know when are we supposed to use it and how are we supposed to use it. For ultimately, he always gets the glory. It should always be for advancing his kingdom. So that was my lesson that I learned last week. And now just real quick, now it goes into boundaries. So I prayed about it. And I was like, Lord, what do you want me to teach on this week? Like, what do you want me to learn? Because it's always a lesson for me. It's like, we're all learning. But I think because we're in the same region, in the same community, we're, we're learning together a lot of the same lessons, right? So I prayed and I heard the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord say, Read Second John, Second Epistle of John. But before that, I'll get into this. So boundaries. 
Jesus had them. We must learn to have them as well to protect the garden of our souls. God is the only one that knows the heart of a man. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. That's why he says, judge not lest you be judged. All we can do is look at the fruit in a person or a ministry. Is it bearing love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control? The fruit of the Spirit should go along with the gifts and the call. Because the gifts and the call are without repentance. You can be super anointed, have a powerful prophetic gift, have a gift for deliverance, have words of knowledge. You can have all that. But if you're not operating with the fruit of the Spirit, be careful. Because what did Jesus say to those ministers? He said, you know, they said, but Jesus, we cast out demons in your name. We heal the sick in your name. What he goes, depart from me. I never knew you. Right. So if they don't, if we don't walk with the fruit of the spirit as well as the gifting, we are in danger of that. And the way we, we get the fruit is he is the great gardener and we stay plugged into the vine. Amen. Right? Um, in the second epistle of John, he addresses the elect lady and her children and their spiritual children, whom he loves in truth and all those who have known the truth which abides in them. So he is talking about true believers in Christ who have been set free in the truth. Okay, how cool is this? He's talking to a woman who has spiritual children with a house church. I did not know that about Second John. When I, when I asked the Lord, what do I do? What, what did I do wrong? What did I do right? What should I do about that? How do I handle this? Because I had a lot of reactions, different reactions from different people. You know, some people were very triggered. Some people were like, that's not of the Lord. Other people were like, that was fire. I'm like, mm, uh, you know, so I prayed. And this is one he gave me. So John says, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth. As we received commandment from the Father. Now, I plead with you, lady, <laughs> not as though I will write a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world and do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Okay, so I think this is more of a warning for what's coming. We're all going to have house churches probably. We're all going to be at these meetings. These meetings are going to grow. The Lord is going to be highlighting Fraser Park. People are going to be coming here because God's doing something on the mountain for his glory. So this is a warning to all of us. Whoever transgresses, and to LA too, I know you guys have meetings too, and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who fights in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor even greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. That's 2 John 4 to 11. Talk about some boundaries, right? I think as a church, we've largely been taught, just love everybody, invite everybody, invite everybody, which we should love everybody. And only God judges the heart. But we got to look at the fruit, and we got to be careful who we're inviting in our house. We've got to be and careful because it will spoil the whole, it will hurt more than it'll help that one that you think you're going to try to help. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. The, what thing? the seeker friendly thing is not from God. Oh. No, that's a watered down gospel to about numbers to make more money for a church, in yeah. my opinion. So John is encouraging a woman who is a mother of God's kids, which many of us are mothers and fathers of God's kids in here. She's an elect lady in the family of God. He's encouraging her to set boundaries. It appears she has a ministry out of her home. He is firmly telling her that if anyone does not bring the doctrine of Christ, she is not even to greet them, let alone let them into her home. These are what healthy boundaries look like. So then I'm like, Lord, what is the doctrine of Christ? I'm not exactly sure. I think I know, so I looked it up. 
In the Gospel of John, the apostle had already written that God's word is truth. That's John 17, 17. He also proclaimed that Jesus himself, who is deity, is John 1, 1. He was the truth, John 14, 6. It is clear from his gospel that if we love Jesus, we will keep his commandments, John 14, 15, and 15, 14. We must also receive the truth that Jesus is deity who came in the flesh, John 1, 14, and 1 John 4, 2 to 3. In his letter to the elect lady, John reiterates what he already stated in his gospel, namely that the doctrine of Christ is composed of Jesus' commandments, doctrine, which we are to obey, and Jesus' deity. 2 John 1, 9 to 11 states, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son, Oh, yes, I already read that. If anyone comes to you, does not bring the doctrine, do not receive him into your house or greet him. So, uh, so the original language is what is known as the genitive case, which shows possession. Unfortunately, the problem is that there are many different types of genitives in the original language. What does genitive mean? We have to look that up. Let's look it up because I forgot to look it up. This is from, I was going to read you, it's the gospel. Uh, it, no, okay, we'll talk to you later. Um, this, is that, this is the article I looked up to explain it. I should have looked up genitive. But basically, they're giving you what, that there's either the doctrine about Christ. If this is what is meant, it's using the genitive that false teachers in the context were attacking the deity of Christ. So if you have anybody that's trying to say that God, Jesus isn't God, that's, that's the doctrine about Christ. The doctrine from Christ is when false teachers would be attacking the specific teachings from Jesus, Jesus, which were carried on through the apostles and prophets by way of the Holy Spirit. Which is interesting, because we've been talking about the kingdom age, which is getting back to the fivefold ministry, which scripture clearly says the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets by the Holy Spirit. So then... The third most accurate translation would be to leave the of translation because this would refer to both the teaching and the deity of Jesus. The reason why this is the case is because, let's see, this is still the same old verse that I had. Um, simply put, we're to do what Jesus did and say and teach what he taught. As disciples, we should do all with love and the fruit of the Spirit. I believe this will produce the unity of the Spirit that we all desire to follow Christ in earnest. So then more unhealthy boundaries. God was showing me a lot of stuff when I was gardening out here. In this land, there's a lot of hard rocks. Like the first thing I had to do was pull out thousands of rocks out of my dirt garden. Um, so he is the vine, we are the branches. The analogies in scripture that Jesus used we must protect our garden of our soul and others that God has given us care for. I must protect my home and the ministry God has given me to do. We all must. It's not about me. It's about staying healthy. It's an example to help others stay and be healthier. Boundaries are godly and definitely required in these evil days. Scripture warns us against the little foxes that try to come in and eat up the garden. We're also warned about the birds that steal the seeds. The rocky soil, which is hard to grow in. And something I noticed in the natural is under every weed I pulled up, it, there was rock underneath it. So the weeds tend to be attracted to hard soil and to, to rocks. Rocks to me represent hardness of heart, offenses, unforgiveness, bitterness, pride. Weeds represents the strangling out uh, the life with they strangle out healthy plants with the worries and the cares of this world and ungodly entanglements. Pests, to me, are demonic influence. So we need to keep the gate up. Don't give place yeah. to the devil. Especially those flies. Right? Oh, yeah, those flies. Well, we yes. heard last week that the anointing, that the shepherds use oil on their sheep to keep the flies away, protects them from the flies and the pests. So the anointing, again, goes back to why we meet together to worship in unity. So we get in the glory, get in his presence, then we're coated in his anointing. It'll protect us from these demonic pests. 
If you slip, quickly repent and close the door. Shut the door. Because as my favorite, one of my favorite Bible teachers, Andrew Womack, he always says, if you open up the door, the devil's going to come in, eat your lunch, and pop the bag. He's like, he's a bully. The devil's a bully. So you don't want to give him an open door. You don't want to let him pop your bag and eat your lunch. Jealousy and judging others is a no-win game. Comparing yourself to others is a no-win game. Each one of us has our own race, and we are each starting from the point that God has started us from. Some of us are further along in the race just because we started sooner. Doesn't mean we're better. Some of us will get tired and grow weary and fall over to the side. New racers are going to come join the race. They're going to jump in and start running alongside us, and then they'll give us encouragement to keep going, to pick up those who have fallen, to get them back up in the race. Others who have been running a long time can help the new ones who navigate, uh, to navigate how, we, how to race effectively. The race in Christ isn't just about yourself. You do have your own race, but you are also here to help your brothers and sisters cross the finish line. Amen. This is why we have to love our neighbor as ourselves. We can learn a lot about warfare by studying King David. <coughs> David was prepared for battle through many years of tending to the sheep, where he fought the lion and the bear to protect the sheep. Before he became a mighty warrior, he was a shepherd, and, and he was just the ready, like the, the least one they expected to be anointed to do the job. He fought the giant Goliath after fighting the lion and the bear to protect the sheep. Then he was being prepared for the epic battle that he would have against Saul, which lasted a very long time. Whenever Saul was overcome with fits of jealousy, he would attack David. David had to endure under this religious, jealous, spirited Pharisee who couldn't honor who David was in the Lord. David was not perfect, no person but Jesus is, but he was called and chosen and set apart and he was prepared to be a mighty warrior for God. And I'm not sure if it's the same Saul that became Paul when the scales fell from his eyes. I don't know. Maybe someone who knows for sure if it's the same one. No, that was King Saul. So. Yeah, yeah, it was King Saul. Saul. Okay, but I did think it was a co- not a coincidence that there were two Sauls with the same Persecutors, spirit yeah. battling against God's people. Then what he showed me is endurance and humility mm-hmm. is key. Humility, that was also in the Upper Room uh, sermon, was so good. It says, it means to depend completely on God, not on self. Amen. So that's, that's another thing. I think we've been taught that humility just means we have to grovel and stay low. Just go, just go down, go down, go down. Stay down, stay down, stay down. Don't talk. Stay low, stay low. That's not no. what humility means. No. Humility means... You are dependent on God. Amen. We know where our power comes from. We know that our authority is nothing that we have in our own. We can do nothing apart from him. But we can be bold in him. And we need to be bold. And we need to know our authority. Because we're fighting a roaring lion, like a lion, who's seeking whom he may devour. There is nothing wrong with being bold. He, he said the righteous was bold as a lion. But the humility is dependent on God. We can rely on our life lessons and others' lessons that they have learned in prior battles. We get wisdom and strength on how to fight. He'll use our own lessons to make us better equipped for warfare. But the key is always to stay completely dependent on him. Know that he is our source of grace, love, and power. And then it goes back to the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these, there is no law. That's Galatians 5, to 23. The fruit of the Spirit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions. Joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Those are the same scriptures, but in the Passion Translation. It's Galatians 5, to 23. Then he gave me this one about the Spirit. For example, the Spirit gives to one the gift of the word of wisdom. To another, the same Spirit gives the gift of the word of revelation knowledge. 
To another, the same spirit gives the gift of faith. To another, the same spirit gives gifts of healing. To another, the power to work miracles. To another, the gift to prophesy. To another, the gift to discern what the spirit is speaking. And to another, the gift of speaking different kinds of tongues. And to another, the gift of interpretation of tongues. But remember, it's the same Holy Spirit who distributes, activates, and operates these different gifts as he chooses for each believer. There are nine gifts and nine fruits of the Spirit. I don't think that's an accident either. So just make sure when you're operating with the gifts of the Spirit or, or you are receiving ministry, make sure the fruit of the Spirit is present. Otherwise, you may be receiving a ministry or giving a ministry from the wrong spirit. So that's the warning to us. It's just to make sure that the, the ministry fits with the fruit of the Spirit. If people get really, you know, powerful and loud and demonstrative, but it's all about me, where's God? Not there. So we have to be careful. But that doesn't mean people aren't going to be under the unction of the Spirit of God and be powerful. And they are going to be bold. So we, we're going to have to allow that freedom because some people have a lot of power. They have, people called to deliverance have power of God. Some people are going to kind of be like dynamite. Dunamis has dynamite. So we can't be so quick to judge too and say that's the devil. You know, um, we have to discern. We have to discern. And again, I know some people are not used to that kind of power gift ministry. Some people have been in the pews for 30 years listening to the word of God and they're, and they're good Christians, but they have never experienced the power. But this is what God wants us to do. He's starting to give us power because we need it. Amen. We need it yes. to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils and take up serpents. Yes. 